Welcome to Boring Topics. This episode is the first in a series on the decline and or fall of the majority of the home computer companies of the 70s and 80s. That was an era of major rivalries amongst a wide array of personal computer companies fighting for control of the market. There are few of those companies left standing today, and really only Apple still plays a significant role in personal computing. Even the leader that initially emerged from the fray as the undisputed winner was only able to enjoy its victory for a handful of years before going into irreversible decline, and today, although still in existence, is no longer in the business of making personal computers. That company was IBM, and its rise and fall in the PC market is the subject of today's video. Few companies have entered a market with such expectations, and even fewer initially met or exceeded them so much. In 1980, IBM bestrode the computing world like a colossus. They had developed the floppy disk and hard drive, and not only controlled the mainframe market, but also held a massive portion of the production and distribution of the ubiquitous punch cards that formed the primary input method for millions of records into mainframes around the world. IBM's dominance in mainframe computing had been well established since the 1960s when it bet the company on the development of the 360 series of mainframes, spending the equivalent of $42 billion 2018 dollars on their development and securing a stranglehold on the mainframe market. History was littered with the carcasses of companies who had attempted to take on IBM in the mainframe business. By 1980, competitors like General Electric, Burroughs, Control Data, Digital Equipment Corporation, Cray, and Honeywell were bankrupt out of mainframes entirely, or were primarily competing for whatever business IBM was uninterested in pursuing. Even those that did find a profitable niche like DEC with its line of PDP mini computers or Cray with its supercomputers still remained a fraction of the size of IBM. IBM's domination of the mainframe computer market eventually was so overwhelming and came so close to a monopoly that the US government took it to court. The resulting antitrust lawsuit lasted from 1969 to 1982, and that could have potentially resulted in IBM going the way of AT&T and being broken up into multiple baby IBMs, although the company eventually prevailed in court. In 1980, IBM's operations were massive, 340,000 employees, $27 billion of assets, $26 billion of sales, and profits of $3.6 billion. The saying went, nobody ever got fired for buying an IBM. The IBM sales reps were close friends with their customers, and many heads in upper management of businesses were close friends with IBM upper management to the point where they would never even consider looking elsewhere for their company's computing needs, even if IBM's mainframe offerings were inferior to what the competition was offering. But by 1980, IBM was also a stultifying bureaucracy with layers upon layers of middle management and processes and procedures. Everything was studied and examined from multiple angles, and any objection or non-concurrence in IBM parlance could derail a project. If a project somehow emerged from the Byzantine approval process, it tended to quickly become bloated with additional features and massive personnel expansion, as well as become the object of turf battles as various IBM departments fought for control of promising career-making projects. This was due to the fact that with all of its competitors seemingly vanquished, careers were made and broken at IBM over internal turf battles as managers fought to vanquish internal rivals in the only form of contest that seemed left. IBM became driven by seemingly endless stacks of foils or overhead transparencies, with an individual's credibility determined in a large part by how well they could foresee questions and prepare foils to answer them during their presentations. Some IBM managers even went so far as to have overhead projectors built directly into their rosewood desk so they could be immediately ready to use their foils or have others show them their own. IBM was not entirely blind to the emerging PC market of the 1970s as the first wave of viable personal computers began to make an impact on an entirely new market. The trinity of the TRS-80, the Apple II, and the Commodore PET 2001 had shown that demand existed for a small computer that could be used by an individual, not a massive computer that ran an institution and filled up most of a room. Although IBM chairman Frank Carey wanted a simple machine developed for sale to home users, by 1980, all that had resulted were two failed attempts, the Data Master and the 5100 series, and a proposal was even being floated to just purchase computers from video game giant Atari and simply sell them with IBM's label attached. At a seminal meeting just before the 4th of July, 1980, this last idea was shot down by an angered Frank Carey, who then listened intently to an alternative proposal by Bill Lowe, who presented a plan to take a different approach to developing a personal computer. However, his boss, Jack Rogers, head of the enormous General Products Division, said that he had too many projects going on to fund another one. This angered Carey, who told Lowe that he would fund the project himself, and told Lowe to take 40 people down to a small facility in Boca Raton, Florida, and keep them sequestered away from the massive IBM bureaucracy. Their task was to develop a personal computer that would catapult IBM into the home computer market, 
market, with Kerry saying, this is the kind of machine that will really capture people's hearts and minds. We have to build this machine. Although he now had approval to proceed, and with Kerry's backing, a shield to protect himself from interference by other IBM managers or layers of bureaucracy, Lowe knew that in order to bring the project to fruition within the year time frame that he had been given, he would need to get his operating system from someone else. Having it developed from the ground up by the usual massive team of IBM programmers, who were paid by the K-Lock, or thousand lines of code, would only result in a massively delayed OS, and IBM didn't have the time. The goal was to bring the project to fruition in the space of one year. Following that weekend, Bill Lowe had one of his direct reports, a mid-level executive by the name of Jack Sams, make a call to a young college dropout by the name of Bill Gates. Head of a small software development firm of some 31 people, Lowe was hoping that he could buy or license an operating system from Gates. Through a complicated process that is worth a separate video of its own, Gates eventually provided IBM with an operating system, one that would eventually be called MS-DOS. Gates also provided it to IBM with a contract that gave him the right to license its use to any other company he chose to, with a hubris born of their firm belief that no other company would ever be in a position to use a license to MS-DOS, IBM had no issue agreeing to that stipulation, a decision that would come to haunt them down the road. Bill Lowe set up operations in Boca Raton, but by fall of 1980 he was gone to run another section of IBM's sprawling operations. His replacement was a charismatic man named Don Estridge, a 43-year-old, 6-foot, 4-inch manager who had been the project manager for a poorly received previous IBM project, the Series 1 mini computer. In disgrace and looking for a way to redeem himself, Estridge threw himself into the project. As a man who owned, used, and loved his Apple II, Estridge was an excellent choice to lead the effort to create a personal computer that would not only meet what the market wanted, but would also hopefully create a new standard for home computers in a market currently rife with competing and incompatible standards. As 1980 gave way to 1981, the new computer took shape. Forced to move quickly by the tight time constraints they were working under, it was built from chips and parts developed outside of IBM. The computer was sturdy and businesslike, with a rugged construction that promised to hold up well under heavy use. When it was released in late 1981 as the prosaically named Model 5150, it created a sensation. IBM, the most powerful name in computing, had just put their stamp of approval on the emerging personal computer market. As far as the market was concerned, the personal computer had moved out of the hobbyist camp and was now a serious machine. The 5150 was a roaring success from day one, with machines flying off the shelves faster than they could be built. A more powerful successor, the XT, was released by Estridge and his team in early 1983, with a third, even more powerful one, the AT, released in 1984. This propelled IBM to its highest ever share of the home computer market, 75%. But problems were already beginning to appear as the weight of the IBM bureaucracy began to exert itself. On August 1st, 1983, Estridge was forced to expand his small independent group into a full business division named the Entry Systems Division. Overnight, the new division went from 4,000 people to 10,000. Layers of middle management began to appear and multiply, and Estridge was no longer free to respond swiftly and effectively to market pressures. Estridge also no longer had direct access to IBM's chairman, instead of having to go through a minimum of three layers of management before reaching Kerry. Estridge's own developers could also no longer reach him directly, even by phone. Still, Estridge pushed forward and started his team working on another new product called the PC Junior. He had noticed that the original PC models had wound up as more of a business computer than a home computer, so he felt that the market would respond favorably to a somewhat stripped down PC, one that could be sold through normal retail channels such as Sears and Kmart. He originally wanted the product to be very expandable, allowing its owners to add various peripherals and plugins that could eventually transform it into a full PC. But then IBM's various levels of bureaucracy, and most importantly, the powerful management committee began to stir. The management committee sat at the apex of the IBM managerial pyramid and was the ultimate arbiter of internal disputes between IBM's many divisions. It wouldn't do to release a product that could threaten an existing product line of another division. IBM was used to dealing with mainframes that could be sold for many years without too many changes. They were not used to the frenetic evolution that characterized the PC market, with new lines needing to be brought out in 18 months or less. IBM was planning to, and had committed to, selling and supporting the original PC for 10 years. So the promising PC Junior was scaled way back. 
its full keyboard was replaced by a chiclet keyboard that found nothing but derision from its intended users. Most of the peripherals that would have allowed it to be expanded and upgraded were canceled, prices were raised, and the plan to sell through retailers scrapped. The PC Junior limped onto the market and became the first major IBM PC flop, with almost no takers to be found. In 1985, the product was quietly discontinued. Although IBM still represented the standard in PC computing in 1985 and was still selling PCs as fast as they could be made, institutional malaise was beginning to make its force felt in increasingly unfortunate ways. Development of further PCs was slow, and the PC Junior failure, as well as problems with the hard drives on many of the ATs, had damaged Estridge badly in the eyes of the IBM bureaucracy, where you were only as good as your last project. As IBM vacillated, committees were formed to explore what the next step should be, with IBM confident that the market would wait as long as needed for IBM to come out with the next product. But the market wasn't standing still. Since the IBM PC used standard off-the-shelf components, and due to Bill Gates' willingness to license MS-DOS to anybody that wanted it, other companies began to clone the IBM PC line. Companies like Compaq began to iterate faster and faster, racing out with new and faster products far ahead of IBM's slow and delay-ridden processes. IBM was also crippling its software development, both internal and external. A small company called Software Publishing was once ordered by IBM to remove a feature from its word processor that it was planning to release for MS-DOS. This feature would have competed with another word processor that IBM was planning to release. Software Publishing was also forced to spend a year rewriting one of its other programs that it felt was ready for release, but IBM demanded further changes before it would approve it as meeting IBM standards. This delay caused Software Publishing, a small company that couldn't afford lengthy development delays, to go ahead and release its product on competitor's hardware, which of course ran the same MS-DOS that Microsoft was happily licensing to all comers. Internal applications that IBM developed were slow, and tended to have features such as email removed to force them not to compete with existing products for mainframes. IBM's inability to grasp that the PC market was different from the relatively glacial pace of the mainframe market led them to yet another of many fateful decisions. Towards the end of 1984, Estridge's manager, Mike Armstrong, had decided that a complete rewrite of DOS was needed, one that would make up for all of DOS's legion of inadequacies, such as being unable to run more than one program at a time, and having some very unintuitive and arcane commands, even by the relatively easy standards of early 1980s computing. He also decided that the shiny new PCAT, with its spiffy new hard drive, was powerful enough to last for many years as the main strategic product of the PC division, a decision that he backed up by personally making hundreds of calls to customers, with other sales reps making many thousands of calls themselves, selling customers on the promise that IBM would support the AT for many years, just as it did its mainframes. The shiny new rewrite of DOS would eventually be known as OS2, which is also a story for another video. Suffice it to say that IBM's new plan was to work with Microsoft to develop the new DOS as an eventual replacement for MS-DOS. Problems quickly began to occur as the OS2 project eventually ballooned to more than 1,700 programmers, not including management, that had two entirely separate management teams and were spread across four sites on two different continents. Back at the Entry Systems Division, Estridge's days were numbered. A man who had never liked playing in the politics and back stabbing that characterized IBM's hierarchy, he was removed from the PC division in 1985 and demoted to a show position over IBM's worldwide manufacturing with little actual power. That position didn't last long though, as on August 2nd, 1985, he and his wife were aboard an airliner that crashed while trying to land in Dallas, and they were among the 137 people that lost their lives. The new head of the PC division in 1985 was the man who had originally proposed it in the first place, Bill Lowe. Although he had championed the PC idea in the first place, Lowe still did not personally use a PC other than for email. He also began to implement even more layers of paperwork. While Estridge had shunned memos, Low mandated them. Everything had to have a complete paper trail. Progress on further evolutions of the PC slowed even further. In June of 1985, Lowe signed a joint development agreement with Microsoft that not only formalized the co-development of what would be called OS2, but also replaced the existing DOS contract. Gates got everything he wanted from this. IBM was mostly concerned about keeping its price for MS-DOS as low as possible, and thus didn't care if Gates retained the rights to continue to sell DOS and collect royalties on it from the cloners, who still only accounted for a small percentage of the total IBM PC market. Gates was also completely free to continue development on a little side project at Microsoft 
Microsoft, a graphical user interface called Windows. IBM and Microsoft had an uneasy partnership from the beginning of OS2 development. Their processes were entirely different, with one of the major examples being that IBM tracked its programmer's progress by a thousand lines of code, or k -locks. This encouraged software bloat, whereas Microsoft programmers were more interested in making shorter and more compact code. There was even a major issue around a Microsoft programmer taking an IBM piece of code that took up 33,000 characters and rewriting it to a mere 200 characters, or 1 160th of the space. OS2 limped along in development for years, and when it did eventually come to market in 1987, it was so bloated as to require thousands of dollars of RAM to operate. But by that point, other events had pushed IBM's market share even further down. By the end of 1985, there were a wide variety of clones of the IBM PC from both domestic and foreign companies which were 100% compatible, meaning that any software written for an IBM PC would run without issue on them. And Bill Gates was happily selling MS-DOS to all of them and reaping a fortune in royalties, something he was free to do thanks to his contract. By 1987, Gates' profits from selling MS-DOS to the cloners had reached tens of millions of dollars and he was one of the world's youngest mega-millionaires. Bill Gates was also continuing development of Windows on the side, and the first version was released in 1985 to lukewarm reviews and reception. But he continued working on it, and thanks to more of IBM's mistakes, Microsoft began to wax ever stronger as IBM waned with its once commanding position continuing to crumble as the cloners kept up a relentless assault on both price and performance. IBM wasn't done yet though. With its new OS continuing in development, new plans for both its mainframes and its microcomputers, and a growing realization of the danger Microsoft and its operating system posed, Big Blue prepared a massive counterattack that it was confident would not only reassert its dominance in the PC arena, but would also bring the cloners to their knees. The new plan was built around a new line of computers and an architecture called PS2. Looking to the future, IBM was confident that its new upcoming line of PS2 computers, together with its new OS2 operating system, would wrest control of both software and hardware away from Microsoft and the cloners, bringing both firmly back into Big Blue's hands. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. More videos are coming soon.